allows you to have that uh, 200 grand in income. So what we have identified with those three targets, Curtis, what income do we want now and along the way until we are financially free? Mm -hmm. Two is how does our outside net worth impact our choices with the business? Mm -hmm. And then the third one is the value of the business. Now we can, now we now know today, what does it need to be worth? So if it, if, if it's, if it's only worth $2 million after everything, the equity value and the net proceeds we're 500 grand short. So don't sell it yet. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. and then we can identify what's that target want to be. And then we can start to say, okay, well, if that target equity valuation is 5 million bucks in five years, how do we want our income to evolve along the way there? How do we want our role to evolve along the way there? And if you're saving money in the outside of the business to Curtis along the way there, you might get to the point. I just had this happen with a client where they needed a million and a half less when they finally got there because they saved it outside the business. Which means then they were able to open up some of their exit options like maybe do an internal bio instead of the third party because they don't need money out. Hey, are you interested in learning how to be your own bank? We say you can be a customer of the bank or you can be the bank. So I just want to recognize the sponsor of this show, my firm, Practical Wealth Solutions. And so we help people set up privatized banking systems so that we can get interest moving towards you rather than away from you. So if you want to set up your infinite banking policy up properly, right, we use properly structured dividend paying whole life as a place to store cash. And you want access to a coach that will show you how to integrate this into your investing, into your to expand your business, to protect your capital from market downturns, taxes, uh, predators and creditors, what I want to do is uh, I want you to go to practicalwealthsolutions.net, go to the bottom. We're going to send you a little mini course on banking, and then you can reach out to us. Or, you know, if you already know you want to do it, you can go right to the, the uh, uh, set up a strategy session uh, with one of the coaches, and we will get you on the path to be in the bank. Enjoy the show. All right. Hey, guys. Welcome to another episode of the Practical Well Show. So I have Mr. Ryan Tansom. So Ryan and I, we're like in like uh, mid-podcast speed, <laughs> okay, because we've been in the green room chopping it up for like at least the last 15 minutes, right? So we said, you know, we should record some of this stuff. So... <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> right, right. So <laughs> that's why. So here we are. So let me tell you about him before we before we get into it. So uh Ryan started his um his entrepreneurial career as a at a family business, right? And where he was the uh executive VP responsible for strategic operational and financial strategy of a $21 million company. And he helped turn that company around um and sold it for eight figures to a local competitor in 2014. So he took all his experience and found it Arcona, right? Create and uh, to create the intentional growth framework. Okay. So now we're talking to business owners today, right? Or aspiring business owners. But really, if you've got a business and uh, one of Ryan believes is that your number one asset is the business, which, and y'all hear me say that all the time. You know, one asset <laughs> is, I say, you know, one asset is you and your number mm -hmm. one investment is Knowledge. your business, right? Yeah. And, um, uh, and rather than giving some money to some fund manager you ain't never met, okay, <laughs> as your primary strategy, right? Or people sell their business and then put give all the money to some fund manager you never met, you know. And, and <laughs> which I I don't I don't understand that either. And um, so anyway, what he what he does is he helps owners grow the value of their company with the end in mind through educational training, fractional CFO services, and strategic planning. He also hosts a 
popular podcast, Intentional Growth. Um, he's over 250,000 episodes, 360,000 downloads, and guests like Gino Wickman. Gino's from uh, the Traction book, right? Yep. yep. 250. It's now 340 episodes. It's definitely right. not 250,000, Curtis. Right. So I, I'd be one busy dude. 250. Like, <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> I was that's one. that's like one camera. library, man. Right, right, right. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to give you all this information at the end, but I wanted to get that out there because what, one of the things that we talked about, we were talking about scaling and um, how do you, you know, I always vacillate with our firm. So I said, you know, I always tell you people, uh, Ryan, that the, the show is free consulting for Curtis mm -hmm. is really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it, man. We're on a journey together. <laughs> right, on a journey, right? And so we've been talking. It's like we're finishing each other's sentences. So it's been really <laughs> cool. And um, uh, but it's like, you know, when do you grow? Like, you know, you I could be a master surgeon with a nurse and just see clients and I love working with people. And, and then, you know, hiring sometimes key people or people that can do it like you is kind of like herding cats mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and uh we also before we dance she's like how do you build a virtual culture in a virtual company we neither one of us had to answer that yet so we were gonna... <laughs> but so that's where oh, i said we were in misty yep. he's about to answer he said no you should record this okay so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well and i think it, it uh, as i was gonna say to you curtis though you know i love how you worded it to the master surgeon or how did it was the master surgeon of uh, with a with a you... nurse or nurses or build a field hospital of yep, you know yep. so it, it's such it is literally the root question that needs to be answered mm -hmm. for us as an entrepreneur and and uh, I actually dealt with a, a physician where it was one, him and then two uh, associates and forty nine assistance essentially it was mm -hmm. just a pyramid and then the guy had an eight million dollar job essentially because even though he had not because he had not made the decision that right. you were talking about curtis so uh, i'll kind of just start with the, the material i'm about and the concepts i'm about to just quickly go over came from turning around the business and all this stuff i wish you would have known which is how to view the company and run the company like a financial asset yeah and so I'm going to layer a couple concepts in Curtis before jumping in and because I think it's important to how do we answer that? Right. And so for me, one of my favorite things out of life, Curtis, is trying to figure out what drives people. Like, what's your goal? But seriously, like, why are you, why are you doing what you're doing? Right. And it's like me as like the five-year-old kid. And so now when I do all these big pre uh, keynote presentations or workshops with entrepreneurs, Curtis, I'm like, first of all, so I asked two kind of uh, priming questions at the beginning. I said, first one is, do you raise your hand if you know if what you're doing is worth it? Hmm. Most people don't know how to answer that, man, because it could be financial. It could be time, could be lifestyle, could be passion, purpose. And I just let people soak in that because most the fact that most people can't answer that is a big problem because yeah. we have to figure out with all right. the risk. And it's time it's hard to reach a target you don't have. Exactly. It's like the whole the Alice in Wonderland. They're like, where are you going? You'll definitely not get there because you. Or what is, what is it's the Yogi Berra. What's the way to get? Yeah, I, yeah, we yeah, all yeah, yeah. We're both butchering it, but it's like, you get the point. <laughs> it's in it, it's so because I can build a financial model for a company towards yeah. a goal if I know what the goal is. So then, I'll ask people. So what are your goals right now? And I hear the five million in revenue, ten million in revenue, or go hit the million, go from million to five million, whatever it might be. And it's like, well, I owned a twenty-one million dollar company with my dad that lost nine hundred forty thousand dollars in '09, and if we would have sold, we'd have owed the bank money. So I think revenue is kind of a stupid goal. Mm. And then I just let people sit in that, and it's like, well, what are we actually marching towards then? Right. Truly, like so, like the decided, the decided. The decision to build the field hospital or be the uh, the surgeon, like what are you solving for? Right. So there are there are a couple of ways that the intentional growth framework that I helped synthesize Curtis because I love taking the complicated, making it simple, thinking about myself from ten years ago because I didn't have these tools, these concepts. So we sold the business, and I wish I wouldn't have, and for various reasons. But the the first thing is, what is the target equity valuation? that we want at a point in time, not revenue. Because mm -hmm. if it's revenue, how do we know whether we should launch a new product or service? How do we know whether we should give up equity to our key executives? How do we know whether we should buy that company or get rid of those clients and manage the, like how are we managing the company like a portfolio of mutual funds, like you said, right. if we don't have the target equity value? Because mm. if it's revenue, you can scale yourself to a $100 million company just like you can 
buy a million dollar house and owe 2 million on it. Right. Right. <laughs> so who cares right. what the, I have people on my podcast that skilled to a hundred, hundred million and went bankrupt. Who cares mm-hmm. then? Right. That's not, mm-hmm. that's not worth it to me. So the reason I, I'm, I'm belaboring this point, Curtis is that target equity valuation. If you said to me, Ryan, I wanted a million dollars in cash flow. We don't have to get into this technical nature if we want, but the normalized EBITDA or cash flow. Right. I want a million dollars in cash flow in 2030 at a five multiple. That's how many years of cash flow that the company would be worth. So let's mm-hmm. say it's a five. So it's a $5 million equity value in 2030, assuming you have no debt. Okay. How are we going to fund that is the first question. Mm-hmm. So if you're that surgeon right now, or you're the executive recruiter, or if you're the CPA, or you're the consultant, or you're the plumber, HVAC, you see, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So then you say, okay, I need to fund that growth plan. So first I need to figure out how am I going to fund that? I I need to be able to take a salary. I read an article, Curtis, that uh, a couple months ago, that 26.2% of privately held business owners don't pay themselves a salary in the U.S. That is a shame. Yes, that's shocking. They're broke and they're they commingle their money. This is the stuff I see. Yeah, they're they're living off right. the float, dude. They're living off the line of credit and all the other cash flow float. So they might be able to pull down eighty and grand. That is 100. stressful. Like I've lived through that. You know <laughs> that <laughs> that is. <laughs> we had a we had a quarter million dollar payroll every two weeks, man, and it was never. You got to hit right. it, and you got to right. hit that before you right. pay yourself. So my point is, target equity valuation. This is mm-hmm. what puts everything into perspective. Mm-hmm. How are we going to fund that? Because then we'll be able to figure out our growth rate. But then we say, okay, well, we pay yourself a salary. Like we have to pay ourselves a salary first to make it worth it. Then we have to figure out how we're going to fund it. Then we, we got to pay our taxes, man. Like everybody pretends that we don't, but like, let's not make this a surprise. Right. And then the third, the fourth thing, Curtis, is if we want additional distribution, so that's essentially cash flow on top of your salary, that's mm-hmm. excess. Those four things, funding, salary, taxes, and distributions need to be tied to that target equity valuation. Then we have our trade-offs, Curtis, because then like, let's say go now we can go back and actually start to answer your question, which is, let's say you say, I need to make 150 grand. That's my salary. Okay. Well, if you're finally making that 150 grand, let's say you're doing 400 grand in revenue and you're like, okay, now I got to figure out, do I want to create the hospital or- Right. You know, save money. It's like, well, okay, well, can you afford to reduce your salary or take no more distributions on the way to that 2030 goal? If you say, hey, I'm good. I can pile all the money back in. I don't need to save any. And this is how I want to create my wealth. And I only grow at 6%. Like, hey, that's not a big deal, right? Right. However, I want to give you an example that, that, uh, so like, let's say that individual said, I'm willing to, I can actually make the numbers work of my salary that it can fund itself through cash flow from operations. Right. So I don't have to go take on an investor or debt or anything like that. Let's say you have a different circumstance where I had a gentleman, he came through our training and he had, he had an executive recruiting firm, Curtis, so similar to the example of the surgeon. So they do two and a half million in revenue. Mm-hmm. They've got like six or seven employees. It's recruiting. It's legitimately the value of the business is the person's network. Right. So as as owner centric as you can get in a business, right? Individuals making some seriously good income. But after going through our training, he's like, because like we're talking about investing for the valuable asset. Right. And he's like, you know what he figured out? I'm not going to create a valuable asset. He said, I'm the amount of work it would take to build the infrastructure, the systems, the processes, the people and all that stuff over the next six years, he would have to forego all of his distributions, reduce his salary to hopefully have a valuable asset. But that's more of a hope. Right. And he didn't need to because the math between there, like those five or six years, he could have pulled all the money out of that company and been lean and mean and saved just as much. Yeah. So his deal was, he goes, he goes, now I'm clear because I don't want the return on life experience of building the asset of the headaches and the people and the systems and the risk. When I know I can pull down two to 500 grand a year for the next six years, give it to Curtis or the other planners or whatever, be like, nah, yeah, I know that you yeah. do you AUM, but it, there's a different investment strategy that can meet his wealth means. 
Does that make sense? Where it's like it's, it's yeah. It's I mean, goal. I that's kind of what I talk to people about because you want to be uh. So in our system, we call it getting to a position of F you. Right? Yeah, exactly. F you right, right? Right, Choices. right. F you might, right. Yeah. So yeah. passive income greater than expenses. So a lot of times you need to pay yourself. You need to take a profit. And then the profit is you buying or building assets outside of the business. Outside right? of your it's income, outside right? Outside of Once your you income. Your... Yeah. Right. Yep, so, so now, you know, so the business is one thing. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, because see what we call investing and say, look, you want to, I teach the, um, in our system, we call it the three rules of investing. Invest in what you know, invest in what you can control, and don't chase returns. And so pretty so, much everything that is the opposite of what the entire world did for the last correct. 36 months? Yes. Because, <laughs> Would you like uh, an NFT and back by some crypto? Right. What do you know about it, right? <laughs> and, and and can you control it? And that's my filter for people. It's like, you don't know. Then, then, then you know, put in your business, save your money until you figure that out, okay? Yes. And uh, so I... Um, so I'm the party pooper. Like I'm the contrarian. So what's that guy? Um, what's the guy? Uh, Lee, uh, Errol, Earl, lead the field. I was reading a Dan Kennedy newsletter. Uh, the strangest secret guy, Earl Nightingale, okay. right? Yeah, yeah, he yeah. says, listen, if you, if you walk around, you can't tell what you need to do successful. Just look at everybody else and do the opposite because the majority is usually wrong. And uh, so, so <laughs> that's oh, what and, I, and I just, uh, oh, uh, Curtis, you got to put a link. It Charlie Munger just came out with a a uh, an interview. They released it on Spotify mm-hmm. from uh, when he spoke at Massachusetts University, where I believe he graduated, and it's from 2010. And they just published it on Spotify, Curtis. And it's like an hour and 10 minutes of the most sound advice like you were saying and he said something like the the hardest thing ever is to do normal things when everybody else has lost their mind right 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 right. (laughs) and i you know i was like listen if i don't want to learn about it i don't do it right because if i don't if i do it i don't and i don't know it i'm not i'm speculating right i'm Mm -hmm. suffering from fear of missing out and that's what most people do and uh you know i but can i control my business can i you know, do I know the four ways to grow revenue of a good business? Then I'm going to focus on that. That's that's because that's where my expertise lies and that's where my control lies. And I love, I was looking at the diagram on your website, just just seeing it as a business and just breaking it down into different sections. Mm-hmm. I love that, right? And could that apply for, I know you probably have a size you work with, but, but could my, like I work with somebody as an electrical contractor, could, 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 a, a regular business or service business still kind of think the way you think about money. Would that benefit them? About so, not money, but their this, business. But this is actually like to your point. It's actually just thinking about labor, business, and money all at once. And like, if anybody, the amount we've had up close to five hundred people go through the training now, Curtis, and like the amount of times it's in the hundreds of people say, "I wish I would have known this." And it's like, cause like all it does is it immediately changes their decision-making framework. Yes. So if you're, if you're that, if you're that plumber, HVAC consultant, CPA, you name it, and you're sitting there going, Hey, I've been making 300 grand. Cause it's me plus a couple assistant bookkeepers or, you know, whatever the situation me or the electrical contractors, the master electrician right. has a bookkeeper. Essentially you have like seven assistants. I mean, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. It's just like, mm-hmm. it's a pyramid. Then wouldn't you like to know? If you decided to embark upon a seven-year journey of reinvesting with systems, processes, procedures, and all that stuff, <laughs> like, wouldn't you like to know what the outcome is going to be before you just guess and work hard for the next seven years? Because like I said, with that executive recruiter, like their best decision was not to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, like, like it's how many, what, how many times they say the best value a financial advisor can give is when the shit's hitting the fan mm-hmm. they get they get the phone call and they they stop people from doing things right like that's the best thing that you can have so i think it doesn't matter where you're at it's more about thinking through why are we doing what we're doing mm-hmm. and what are our ex- expectations from our experience and financially and hopefully those are kind of tied together on the way towards a long term goal whatever it might be i don't act truly do not care 
what anybody does, Curtis. Here's what I want is I just want to be able to talk to people and hear an articulated reason why they're doing what they're doing mm -hmm. and how they expect what they're doing is going to get them towards where they want to go. It's so well, so basic, but it's like so rare. It, it, yeah. I talked to a client this morning. I said, listen, you know, I used the, 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 you know, if we were, what is it you'd like me to help you with? So if we were having, cause she had no idea what she wanted. The people tell you what they don't want. Oh, I want to stop working and such, such, but they can't tell you what they want. I said, well, let's just push this out 36 months. What has to happen or for you to be pleased with your progress? Mm-hmm. Deer in headlights. It's like, you know, and you got to mm -hmm. pull it out of them to get, I said, cause listen, it's, it's hard to reach a target you don't have. Mm -hmm. And there I said, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm actually got my 403B. I'm da, 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 da. I want to be able to leave work someday. I said, well, okay. How is typical advice designed to give you cash flow? Cause that's what you're telling me. You want to be fancy free. I said, well, okay. What you're doing is not going to take you there. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. doesn't right now. We don't need to get into what you need to do because you don't know what you want, and any road will get you there, right? That's that's the that's the Alice in Wonderland, right? Exactly. And I knew it would come back to me, right? And I just I said, so let's figure out what you want first, and then we'll kind of help you get from point A to point B. And it's it's this, consulting is consulting, so I can see what you're saying from a business standpoint because most the, but most people just what's that old Dunkin' Donuts commercial? We're just trying to make the donuts, and they just get up and <laughs> you totally. right, 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 and, and <laughs> yeah. go to work. <laughs> And my, and actually, my dad, my dad's phrase, Curtis, was like, man, I just want to sell some boxes. The copiers, they're right. just boxes. Just sell some boxes, man. And like, and, and you're so spot on. The amount of times entrepreneurs and founders come through and when they're having our conversation, I had a call this morning. I mean, these people, eight, eight, uh, I'm sorry, there's four brothers started an HVAC company, like doing like 8 million. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I don't know how to do finance. We know how to do plumbing and HVAC. I had a guy that looked at me once courtesy. He's got a $10 million uh, like consulting business in, in the biopharmaceutical mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. He's like, Brian, I'm a scientist, man. I don't know how this stuff works. <laughs> and so it's over and over again. You have someone like my dad, good at selling copiers, good at, you know, chemistry, right. good right. at this. And they find a need in the market that finds the demand. And then as long as the hard work and grit meet that demand, there's going to be revenue and gross profit to some extent, but then the managing the cash flow when you're juggling inventory and payroll, it's the juggling of the cash flow right. and the machine tied to where you want to go. That becomes like the next stage that finds that people find it very difficult. CPAs typically have not run businesses. They know how to move the numbers yes. into boxes. Come on now. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm being very polite. I've been right, uh, right, 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 right. <laughs> well, and because like, Bank, commercial bankers, CPAs, attorneys, most private equity firms, you've never, they typically have not run a business, Curtis. And I always right. say like this, when you have to decide in May, on May 14th, how you're going to hit your payroll while funding all your receivables or while funding your payables, your receivables, inventory, taking your distributions and staying on track, should you buy more or less inventory in May? Or should you do those bonuses because everybody's been complaining or not? Who's going to help you decide right. in that moment when you have a constraint of cash flow and no goal? How are people making these decisions? That's is why business owners are stressed out because you can't even talk to anybody that's not your peer. They can even begin to understand that, that all these people, if you mess up, they don't get paid on Friday, right? And yeah. uh, most people don't understand. I could sell because I'm like you. I had a, you know, my family, I'm a third generation entrepreneur. We had a supermarket growing up. That's so right? awesome. And so it's like my dad, I heard from the time I was seven, you'll never make any money work for somebody else. So I never got that go get a good job talk. You know, I went to <laughs> yeah, college. Right. I, I went to play basketball, right? And I realized the NBA was not looking for 5'11", two guards, right? So I got <laughs> so, uh, so that awesome. you know, so that's you know, that's but I saw that, you know, I you know, where we employed people and I saw the pressure and you know that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And uh, but I also like running my own life and you got people, but you have to want to take on that mantle. Let me I mm -hmm. want to ask you something. I think you said it, but I was I'm looking at my notes and I want to make sure that I want to pull this out. The, on financial targets, right? So I think mm -hmm. you said that, what are the three financial targets an owner should identify, monitor, and measure? 
So these three financial targets are principle number two, Curtis, and it's truly where the personal of business snap together. Okay. Because the, the, because the biggest question so many people have is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know my business is the largest financial asset. A, I don't believe I know how much this will be worth. I'll, I, you know, it's all these false notions people have or false narratives. Like I'll never know what my company's worth. I'll you know, until someone right. will, writes me a check. So they ignore so much of this planning process. So the three financial targets are the first one is what is the target annual income that mm -hmm. you want now and forever, essentially on the way to your point B. So this is the, the, for someone that has a job, it's very easy. It's your income, right? Unless you have some other re, uh, investments that are producing some, you know, other, other passive income from your, your normal W2 job. But with a business owner, your income is most likely coming from your salary, maybe some distributions, maybe some rent from your building. Mm -hmm. It's coming from a lot of different areas, which makes it confusing of where am I getting this annual income? Because essentially what we're trying to do in that first financial target, Curtis, is like, how much money do we need per year, whether we have the business or not? And the reason it's so confusing is because most people run things through the business. So they're, they're getting deductions. We need to, by, by getting this clear, we can figure out, it's actually called an add back and normalized but uh, We don't have to get into that, but like mm -hmm. you're getting the business's financials clean, even though you don't have to stop doing this, you're just accounting for it. And then we say, what do you need in your personal life if you were to gross this up and had to be responsible for it no matter what? Mm -hmm. So let's say it's 200 grand. I'm just making some numbers up mm -hmm. here. We say, okay, you're getting 150 grand in salary and you're using, you're, you're taking 50 grand in distributions out of the business. That's what we want no matter what. We can actually reduce our salary over time and increase our distributions as the company grows so we can afford to hire a, a president or CEO when we can afford the cash flow through distributions. But so first financial target is your income. Mm -hmm. Second one is what is your outside net worth now and over time? And how does that impact what I call your point A, Curtis? So point A meaning, so like my dad and I, we had not a pot to piss in for financial wealth that was liquid outside the company and the mm -hmm. building. Mm -hmm. Everything was personally guaranteed and it was mainly the building and the business. So the outside net worth, if we track and measure the value of these illiquid assets, like the business right. value now, the equity value now, and the building equity value or any of your stocks and bonds, so for the example I give in our training and on the website uh, video that's on the uh, website, it's like, hey, let's say you had two and a half million dollars of stuff outside the business and you wanted to maintain your 200 grand. So we have financial target, number one, your income. Number two, your outside net worth is a two and a half million bucks. The business needs to be worth now. So the third financial target is the value of the business, the equity value. In this example, the business would have to net after taxes and everything, two and a half million dollars to maintain the 200 grand. So if everybody's following me here, you have two and a half million outside net worth mm -hmm. plus two and a half million dollars if you sold the business, which you equal five million dollars mm -hmm. at 4% withdrawal rate, if that's still the main peg. But like, let's say it is, if someone, I know you and I could have another <laughs> yeah, day long. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's... It went from it would yeah the real video we're looking yeah. at each other yeah so I'm like, to his show, eyes like, rolled wow, and I okay, agree okay. yeah they say that but you know other people say two and a half percent so it depends oh, on that, that was maybe right. last year right. now right. maybe now it's yeah so point is in in theory yeah. concept wise yeah. you have five million dollars where you don't want to touch your principal allows you to have that uh, two hundred grand in income so what we have identified with those three targets Curtis. What income do we want now and along the way until we are financially free? Mm -hmm. Two is how does our outside net worth impact our choices with the business? Mm -hmm. And then the third one is the value of the business. Now we can, now we now know today, what does it need to be worth? So if it, if, if it's, if it's only worth $2 million after everything, the equity value and the net proceeds, we're 500 grand short. So don't sell it yet. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. and then we can identify what's that target want to be. And then we can start to say, okay, well, if that target equity valuation is 5 million bucks in five years, how do we want our income to evolve along the way there? How do we want our role to evolve on the way there? And 
if you're saving money in the outside of the business to Curtis along the way there, you might get to the point. I just had this happen with a client where they needed a million and a half less when they finally got there because they saved it outside the business. Right. Which means then they were able to open up some of their exit options, like maybe do an internal bio instead of the third party because they don't need all the money up front. Right. Right. So you start to get the more value you grow, the more choices you have. But I think to your, you know, why you probably called out the three financial targets, because this allows us to identify our point A, our point B, yep. and the, the income we want on the way to the equity growth that we want. Yes, that that's... becomes like the, the, the framework, dude, like without someone clarifying those to me, Curtis, I can't give any advice to anybody. Right. Like, should I, should I sell? I don't know. <laughs> right. Should you, right. should you take on that key executive that wants 25% equity? Should I sell it to him or give it to him? I don't know. <laughs> like, and you, you, know you how, how you, can you know? You don't know your numbers. You don't even know what you're trying to do. I mean, it's like, you know, do you make bad decisions? Cause you're, you have, you know, the number one, like this is the, uh, somebody said the, out of the Napoleon Hills, uh, top Thinking 17 growers. principles, th th oh. or which, or like Matt, some of the older ones. Right. And the one of his principles that people hate that least like is accurate thinking. <laughs> right. And so that's what you're making people do have accurate thinking, because if you have inaccurate thinking, you have inaccurate results. And that's that's a disaster. And you kind of got to oh. hone in on that. That's so powerful what you're doing. Oh, you just you just nailed it, man. And I love my dad to death. If he listens to this. I mean, he, we were business partners, best friends, father, son, mentor, mentee, all the swirling roles in one. My dad runs off of emotion, man. He can wake up, have one idea on the way to work. And then by noon, it's the opposite. And then back at five o'clock, it's back to the beginning. And I'm like, mm -hmm. holy shit, man, this is like going to drive me nuts. Cause I'm the one steering the ship. Right. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh. And right. so, someone, someone said to me recently, like if you're driving a Ferrari, man, it could be one kick-ass Ferrari on the racetrack. But if that driver is constantly looking out the window, man, you're going to be sick. Right. <laughs> and you're probably going right. to crash. That's fun. You know what? I, I feel like I'm taking you all over the place. You know what? Let's go back to, because what? here's what I always tell people. Within our firm, we say principles drive strategy, strategy drives tactics, right? And mm -hmm. taxes drive behaviors. Okay. And so you, what I love when I saw principles, like you have the five intentional growth principles. So you gave us principle two. So I want you to kind of expand on your framework for, okay. for listeners. Yep. And then maybe we pick one more thing. I know where I appreciate yeah, your time, yeah, but I could talk to you all day. We might have to do <laughs> this uh, is fun, uh, man. part two. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so I, but later, yeah. I think that would be a good thing. For sure. For sure. And these five principles, Curtis, I like to say that the market created them because I've been at this for almost a decade mm -hmm. and there used to be six principles. They used to be kind of different or different order. And people would look at me like I'm an idiot. And I'm like, mm -hmm. Well, that didn't work. I should probably change it. <laughs> and so like it just through refinement, yeah. these five principles through intentional growth, the, the, the definition of intentional growth after interviewing hundreds of people in the show, I asked them what intentional means. And we've identified as uh, identi or purposeful action towards a clearly identified outcome. So that's the point of the five principles is how is helping us do that identifying that clearly identified outcome and then making sure that our actions every day are purposeful and aligned with where we want to go. So the, it's not going to shock you then because we went straight to principle two, but principle one is your vision. What do you want from the business and why for your stakeholders, your leadership role, your ownership role, like essentially all the intangibles, we have to figure that out and why otherwise we can't keep going. Yeah. Then we layer on the financial targets. Cause you might say, I want, you know, the whole world. Well, it's like, okay, we can build a plan to right. go get, like we, we then we put the reality of the numbers in principle mm -hmm. two principle three then is exit options we bucket them into five curtis there's a the infinite amount of exit options however what we did is i categorized all of these five exit options by 17 attributes and kind of bucketed them like dogs cats horses it's like hey they're generally there's a lot of different versions of horses but like generally there's some common characteristics so the five exit options are internal buyouts so think pa family members partners managers mm -hmm. second one is what we call acquisition entrepreneurs uh my friend walker dial wrote the book buy them build also like search funds corporate refugees that leave corporate america to buy a company or something mm -hmm. third exit option is esops employee stock ownership plans 
Fourth one is private equity. And then the fifth one is strategic buyers, half of which are probably now backed by private equity. But mm -hmm. it's super important to understand these, Curtis, regardless of whether you wanted to sell now or in 25 years, because each one of these exit options will impact how the company's valued, how the money gets delivered to the seller, and the seller's degree of control over their role mm -hmm. pre and post closing. Mm -hmm. So we layer those five or those five exit options on top of principle one and two. And now we have this clearly identified outcome. What's the target equity valuation? What do we want along the way? What are the different exit options that we want to march towards, even if it's 15 years? Brings us to principle four. Mm -hmm. How do we grow the equity value of our company? So grow value. And we want to grow the equity value of our business by creating sustainable, predictable, and transferable cash flow, therefore increasing the multiple and the equity value of our company, which we call the intrinsic financial value. So it's almost like they can guarantee it instead of hoping that a strategic buyer will come off and just buy them out of the woodworks. That brings us then the fifth principle of your team of advisors. Now that you know who you are, what you want from the business and why, what your financial targets are, all the different ways your outcome can unfold, and you're now growing value intentionally on the way there, build your team so that way you don't have to be the expert in every domain. <laughs> right, right. So in good. so many times, Curtis, like we had a bunch of bad advisors, but I will give them a little bit of grace because my dad and I did not know what the heck we wanted and why. So they were throwing spaghetti against the wall and they were like, there was no way that there was going to be an optimal outcome because if we would have said, here's where we're going and why, and here's how this all works, we would have known whether we had the right people on the team or not. Mm -hmm. And it would have been mm -hmm. easier for us to judge whether they're the right people, but we were just guessing. So those five principles, Curtis, really are just what I wanted to, what I wish I would have had 10 years ago. So I could have enhanced my decision-making to get what I wanted to truly go back to the first question of like, is it worth it? Right. I don't know. Right. If it's not worth it, like go to 3M and get a job with a pension. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Cause you, sometimes you're making less money. You're working all the time. You're, you know, you're unhappy. You're out of shape. Your wife's not happy. I mean, it might be either. Sometimes I wish I used to think it would only be for like maybe 10 seconds why can't I just be a normal person and, you know, get a job? So I have to worry about all this shit. And uh, I, I was, I was, I was for 60 days, man. I got done with the, one of the weekly management meetings and I got up I went straight to the CFO's office and I quit. So I, with no plan, I don't right, know, man, right, maybe, right, you, right, you right. might've maybe lasted five seconds, maybe not right. 10. Right. And I was like, Oh no, right. You know, but then I realized I'm unemployable. Yeah. And I just got to fight a little bit hard. I just had to, you know, I, I knew it was stuff because I knew, you know, in the financial world, I knew people that were doing it and I had met some of them and they were unimpressive. So I'm like, my basketball ego is like, if this knucklehead can do it, <laughs> I can figure this shit out. Yeah, right. And yeah, so that was, yeah. that's my yeah. self-talk. Right. And uh, good self-talk, by the way, yeah. you, you, you've got a good angel on your shoulder. <laughs> right, right, right. And so, you know, and so now it's, it's, it's working out now. I'm like, how, how did I think so small, you know? And now I just see, I, you know, I feel like there's so much opportunity. I was, I'm in this group called Vistage, who I think you would oh, be yeah. a good speaker for. So uh, uh, I've got 35 Vistage speaking gigs booked this year. Oh, already. okay. I, I, I'm i hearing, oh, it would be awesome. Can I get him in my group? And yeah, um, the answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, I'm new, so I don't know if I have any juice yet, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, but I'm, I'm hearing that. And they're like, they ask, well, what do you think about the recession? I says, I, I don't know. I'm not planning on participating in the recession. And they're looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> I, <laughs> Great answer. I love you it. Know, I'm not going to, because I will get better. And because I'm not waiting for some president or some, you know, the economy to fix my business. I'm going to kick If they reduce the in. taxes by 2%, you're not going to like, it's not going to all of a sudden magically no. make your whole world, right? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm going to take market share. I'm going to, I mean, when COVID, I had my best yep. year ever up until last year during COVID because I I decided, okay, people, I'm still open. You know, there's some people who still have money that I can serve. And mm -hmm. I just, I went to work. I was already virtual mm -hmm. and I just put my head down and, you know, you can be a victor or a victim. I decided to be a victor and we hit it. And uh, that was my message to to our clients. But that's, uh, that is I so powerful. I think you're right though. Because it, and it kind of goes back down to your, um, to your 
your your comments about risk and how we can get such high returns in our business. Yeah. The same, even though it's such a good argument to do that because of how much we can control, it's also a blinder that we have where we have too much rose colored glasses sometimes if we're yeah. not objective. So the yeah. same goes for a negative, but <clears throat> though I'll, maybe as we're getting close to wrap up here, I think about there's this one story, Curtis, that I heard about risk that was so impactful to me. And it was talking about the perception of risk. So, and the, this person told me, like, if you can imagine a gymnast that's on the, the balance beam and they're doing backflips and whatever on this thing. And then they go to the end of the balance beam after doing all those ridiculous things. And they do a triple backflip and they land the thing perfectly. So that in this example, that gymnast, that Olympic gymnast lands that 98% of the time. Hmm. I can't even stand on one. Right. So to them, I'd be like, you should start a different sport, like soccer. That's a, that's what I play. Right, right, right. And they're going like, I can do this in my sleep. And I'm like, well, you know, it's risky for you. And they're like, I land this 98% of the time. So the, to them, it's control, skill, and they land at 98% of the time. So the perception of risk based on the skill is different. Yes. And I just love that because it was like you pushing some your perspective of risk onto someone else's is not appropriate. It's what their goals are. Like if they're getting close to retirement, maybe they should start working on a different sport so they have a purpose when they're done with the balance beam. I, I'm just making something up, but yeah, I think it's yeah. the goals of the individual who's in charge should supersede the plan. Right, right. And even to your other point, the you know as your knowledge goes up, your risk comes down, right? So what other people... Like to me, a job is risky because you can get fired for one or two reasons, any reason, no reason at all. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, so I view that as extremely yeah, risky, yeah, right? Yeah, or have, me too. Yeah. And, uh, so it's with your perspective where people are uncomfortable, you know, living on commission and not knowing if, you know, everybody's in business on commission because you don't know if everybody's going to, and everybody's going to go to your site and take an order. If, you know, we would have, uh, we were in the tavern business, we had $100,000 in debt, open our door up and not knowing if everybody's going to come in. You know, right. staff of right. six and, you know, and so, you know, you do some marketing to get people to come in the door, but you don't know. And uh, so I, you know, you I know one it. employer told me once he goes that what the employer said uh, every two weeks during payroll, we're even. Right. <laughs> That's what he would right. say right. to the employees. Like, That's funny. You got your check. You did the work. You got your check. We're even. So next, next payroll, we'll see if we're even again. So That's funny. What, what what's about what about my you know and so people <laughs> don't get me started the the uh <laughs> where they're like well that they fired me well it's their company right well what all the, the five years i've been here i paid you every, every two weeks, weeks three every two weeks three even. right i'm right here <laughs> right you can't say that out in, uh yeah and, yeah. and around regular people right but yeah uh, oh that's so just funny us here on the show and uh Brian, I got a. We, I know you got. I have a. Actually, a, I got a one. Four minutes. Yep. I know you have to run for both. Look at the clock, but I, this is so much fun. And uh, hopefully, I let you get your stuff. I meant to bring you back. I've got a whole list of questions. I didn't I'm get happy to, man. I, this, this is, is awesome. This, this has been a lot of fun, man. It's. Uh, I do a lot of these, and I have been now doing a lot more of these, and it's been really interesting being on the other side of the mic and. It's amazing how many people have shows just so they can talk. And this is not this, man. This is fun, man. You've been, you just asked the right questions. I totally can see you get it. And your listeners uh, should be happy because I, I sometimes I'm like, I don't know how these people have this, these podcasts. So they have like a couple of listeners, but this has been a lot of fun, man. I can't, and how, what do you, what do you get? 250 plus episodes? Yeah, now something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know that? So I, I, I talked to my hosting provider and 95% of podcasts don't last past eight episodes. I've heard that. It's like, what are you doing? Just, just. Or, it's like oh, the gym. I, I got to start. Listen, you got to go. And once you go, you just, you just, you show up. And next thing you know, <laughs> you're four years later, you got 200 and something shows. So uh, 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 Ryan, tell them if they want to find out, uh, you know, what you got going on and follow what you're doing. You have a podcast also. Tell them, tell them. Uh, Best place is our website, man. We've So Curtis, we've got, uh, it's arcona.io. So A-R-K-O-N-A.io. We've got the five principles. We got videos on there and a handout that they can download so that all, all they can, can consume all that for free. We have a financial assessment and checklist. They can go to that, get a bunch of financial videos. And then they've got 340 podcast episodes on there and a link to the calendar, my LinkedIn. So if people, if they find it interesting, they can take action. If not, they can 
they can redirect to some other website. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, that's good stuff. I uh, listen. This has been a lot of fun, and so I will. You're like one of the people I need to stay in touch with. So you know, <laughs> I like if I it. email you every now and then, <laughs> you'll, you'll know why. It's like, listen, I will accept it, Curtis. Man, okay. this has been fun. All right, listen. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening, guys. If you like this show, share it. And uh, we'll see you next week on another episode of the Practical Well Show. Ryan, thanks again. Thanks, Curtis. All right, you're welcome.